So last week we heard the story of the very unfortunate Maud Fancher who had killed her child and then herself because of her belief in spiritualism and that her husband was better served if she could guide him from heaven instead. This week we have a man who also dabbled just a little bit in spiritualism as well, but I think it was more another vice he dabbled in that may have brought him to the dark side. It was nearly Easter, April 1919. Joseph Englehart would murder three people in Laurel, Maryland on a Saturday night, and after hiding himself in the woods, he would end his own life. What brought him to do such horrible deeds? We'll never truly know, but let's look at the people and the events preceding the murder. Joseph Englehart was 40 years old, living in a house with his sister, Mrs. Annie Sloats, she was a widower, and another boarder, Thomas Smythe. It has been said up to the evening of the murders that Englehart had been acting irrationally over the last weeks, and on the day of the murders had been heavily drinking. Allegedly, Joseph had an interest in the occult. He also had deluded himself that his former wife, Mrs. Ray, had cast some kind of spell over him. He would tell people of having seen shapes haunting him and that the spell had made him depressed and caused him stomach issues. So on the train trip from near his home to Baltimore that Saturday morning, Joseph had gone with his brother Charles, who owned a clay bank and employed Joseph. As the train sped past one particular yellow house visible from the tracks, Joseph told his brother, quote, see that little yellow house? That's where my wife lives. It is she who cast a spell on me, end quote. He continues, quote, I am unable to eat or sleep. Queer shapes haunt me in the night. They stare at me from the dark. I see them everywhere. Sometimes they point at me and laugh. Sometimes they yell. Then they whisper in my ear. I am afraid in the dark. The shapes that have haunted me since they cast a spell over me are always following me. I wish they would go away. No, I am not insane. It's the spell, just the spell. I can't cast it off. But I will fool them yet, Charlie. Yes, I will fool them. Last week, I went to a fortune teller over in Baltimore. I paid her $10. She is a great mystic. She will help me cast the spell off. Then the shapes will not follow me. I have great faith in the fortune teller. I'm going to pay her $5 when I visit her today. End quote. Charles felt that his brother's mind was unbalanced. Quote, Joe, I believe you are going insane. End quote. Charles said that once they had reached Baltimore, they went to get lunch, and Joseph seemed excited, and Charles asked what he was going to do besides the seance he had already mentioned. Quote, I am going to buy a pistol. End quote. Charles would later tell detectives, quote, I urged him not to buy the revolver, but he did. End quote. So Joseph had been in Baltimore seeing a serious for a seance, but what did she tell him? It's not known. But he did have a definite interest in fortune telling, as he apparently could be seen reading pamphlets on the subject matter. After his time in the city, seeing a seeress and buying a gun, as you do, Joseph that Saturday afternoon had been seen on the passenger train at Baltimore and had gotten off the train at Condi, three miles south of Laurel which was the nearest stop to his house. He had gotten on the train already inebriated and continued drinking from Baltimore all the way to Condi. It was said that he was acting like a jerk and looking for a fight, basically, and the train employees tried to keep him confined to the smoking car to keep him away from ladies and children. He carried on his person a large bag and he apparently told people he was carrying around four quarters of liquor for a big party he planned for that night. As far as anyone knew, he had disembarked from the train and went to his home, which is about half a mile away. William Henson, Joseph's nephew, saw Joseph when Joseph returned. Quote, it did not occur to me that Englehart contemplated murder. But about five o'clock, my wife called me and said that Mrs. Sloats, my aunt, had been over to our house and said that Englehart had threatened to kill himself. He had been drinking, Mrs. Sloats told my wife. She said that he was quarrelsome and left the house, stating his intention of ending his life. My wife told me to go in search of him to stop him from committing suicide, but I told my wife not to worry that Joe would not commit suicide. I didn't think it was in him. Although I realized he acted queerly of late and seemed irrational, particularly when he was drinking. End quote. Frank Patterson, also a local of the area, had seen Englehart carrying two quarts of whiskey and showed off his newly purchased revolver. So this is some conjecture because there were no witnesses that are still living, but it was thought that Saturday evening when Joseph had returned to his home, again where he lived with his sister, Mrs. Annie Sloats, age 50, and a boarder named Thomas Smythe, age 46, had gotten into some kind of quarrel at about 8 o'clock that night. 
Thomas had been sitting on a couch preparing to light his pipe when he was shot in the heart, apparently caught unawares as he was found with a pipe in one hand and an unlit match in the other. Annie presumably ran when this happened and had made it to a doorway of the porch when she was shot in the back and she fell onto the porch dead. Joseph, having now murdered two people, ran into the nearby woods. Neighbors heard the sound of shots but thought that they came from revelers nearby. I've never heard of people shooting during Easter revelry. Fourth of July, sure, but I guess people celebrate things differently. There was some confusion with the third victim, who was Mrs. Alice Allen. Some say that she was walking on the wooded path between her house and Annie's to ask Annie if she would watch over Alice's house and kids while Alice was visiting family. During Alice's walk, Joseph approached her and fearing she would find out what he had done, he had killed her. Another theory was that Alice had already gone to Annie's house, found Annie dead, ran into the woods to hurry home when Joseph saw her and killed her. Either way, Alice Allen, 42 years old, was killed in the woods at short range near her right ear, about a mile away from Annie's house. The ground near her was disturbed as if there had been a struggle prior to the murder. After Alice's murder, Joseph hid in the woods the rest of the night but then shot himself in the head about 5 a.m. the next morning. He wasn't found until about 9 a.m., again still unconscious, and would never regain consciousness to tell anyone anything, and would die at 2 p.m. in Baltimore Hospital. So how was this all discovered? Alice's husband, Bradley, knew that his wife had originally gone to see Annie about looking after Alice's children while Alice was going to visit relatives in Minnesota, and she had never returned back home. Bradley and his oldest son, Mason, one of their nine kids, in searching for Alice where they knew she had gone, had found the bodies of Annie and Thomas at midnight. Alice was found later, unfortunately, by her 17-year-old son, William. Quote, my mother went over to see if it was possible to employ Mrs. Slotes to keep house for us during her visit in Minnesota. About 8 o'clock in the evening, when she had not returned, my father became worried and set out to find her. He could not locate her, and later in the evening, he came back and got my brothers and myself out of bed. We started out again in the pitch dark, finding our way with the aid of a lantern. We searched through the woods and the swamp for hours. We had almost given up hope. Then I noticed something white lying near the path. I took the lantern and went over to the white object. I knelt down. It was a body of a woman. I turned the face up to the light of the lantern. It was my mother. Quote, I have found her, end quote, I called to my father and brothers. And she is dead. We knew she had been murdered, so we did not venture to remove her from the woods to the house. We wanted to wait for the coroner, Thomas Baldwin. So my brothers and I watched through the night by the side of our mother as she lay out there in the woods. We put a coat over her. That was all we could do. About five o'clock in the morning, we heard a pistol shot over the hill. Englehart was later found there. He had evidently fired the shot we had heard, mortally wounding himself. So all during the time we were searching for our mother, he had probably been lurking nearby. It was a wonder one or more of us had not run up against him and been murdered too. End quote. So what the frickety frack? How could something so horrible happen? If you're looking for a clear motive or any motive, you're going to be looking for a long time. A coroner's jury will be convened to investigate the facts of the case as they are known. Charles Englehart, Joseph's brother, was questioned and could not account for any motive other than that his brother had been acting off of late and had been drinking a lot. No issue between the three, Joseph, Annie, and Thomas, were known. Alice and Bradley Allen had even employed Joseph in earlier years, and seemingly there were no issues between the neighbors. Coroner Baldwin, who had arrived at the scene after receiving the call from the Allens, thinks that Joseph came back from Baltimore Saturday drunk and in a foul mood. At supper that evening, he quarreled with Annie and Thomas. He killed Thomas unawares while he was on the couch. Boo. Annie ran for the door. He shot her while she ran. He met up with Alice either on her way to Annie's or fleeing on her way home while Joseph hid in the woods trying to evade any search parties. As happens in small communities, news spread of the triple murder. Searchers looked for Joseph in the woods as he was already suspected of the crime at this point. Charles, Joseph's brother, William Henson, Joseph's nephew, and H.G. Weicker, a local farmer, ran to a swamp nearby and found Joseph's unconscious body after Joseph had shot himself, Joseph still clutching the gun in his hand. 
In the revolver's chamber was a cartridge and an empty shell. The other chambers were empty. Dr. W. F. Taylor, newly arrived at the scene, told others to take Joseph to the hospital. That he may yet still live, but he never came back to consciousness and was unable to make any kind of statement and die later that day. Bradley Allen, Alice's husband, was told of Joseph's death. Quote, I'm glad of it, the scoundrel. It would be a pity for him to live after what he has done. End quote. Coroner Baldwin is fairly convinced that Joseph is the murderer. The coroner's jury will hear the facts. Chief Deputy Sheriff Thomas H. Garrison said, quote, There is no doubt that Joe Englehart killed his sister, Mrs. Slotes, Mrs. Allen, and Smythe. End quote. Coroner Baldwin, quote, it is my opinion that Mrs. Allen witnessed the murders of Mrs. Slotes and Smythe and that Mrs. Allen was shot down by Englehart while fleeing to her home. Englehart, I understand, suffered brainstorm after returning with two quarts of whiskey from Baltimore. I believe Englehart shot and killed Mrs. Allen because he feared Mrs. Allen would reveal he had slain his sister, Mrs. Slotes, and Smythe. There were no eyewitnesses to the triple tragedy, but all the circumstances tend to show that Englehart did the shooting. I will suggest to the jury that Englehart is the murderer. End quote. Deputy Sheriff Garrison. Quote, I believe that Mrs. Allen appeared on the scene after Englehart had killed his sister, Mrs. Slotes, and Smythe, and fearing that Mrs. Allen would disclose him as a murderer, Englehart pursued her as she fled back to her home and shot and killed her. End quote. The alleged spell-casting former wife, Mrs. Ray, was not at all surprised by this information and could not explain why on earth her former husband would have believed she would ever cast a spell on him. Quote, I left Joe Englehart seven years ago. He possessed a fearful temper, particularly when he was drinking. He was cruel and unreasonable. He would become abusive. I feared him, so I left him. While in one of his fits of anger several years before we were separated, he threatened to kill my brother, Ernest Smithston. He was arrested for assault after he had a pistol and pointed it at my brother. Judge Baldwin fined $10 and put him on a promise of good behavior. I have not seen him for a year. The last time we met, he attempted to quarrel with me. He used to carry a small pistol and people were afraid he would shoot them while he was drinking. End quote. It's just odd. He had no real qualms with any of them. Particularly sad was not only he had been employed by the Allens, but was friendly with the younger daughter of the woman he had murdered. This all happened around Easter, as mentioned. And apparently, Joseph had received an Easter card from Emma Allen. She wrote to him, quote, Dear friend, I wish you many Easter greenings. Your little friend, Emma. End quote. Joseph never saw this card. The card had actually gone to the house of his brother Charles, though it was for Joseph. Charles opened it after the murders and saw what had been written. R.B. Clatterbeck, one of those who testified before the coroner's jury, said that he saw Englehart Saturday night and that he told him to, quote, be careful at the railroad crossings, end quote. Clatterbeck told the jury that Englehart answered, quote, it doesn't make any difference to me whether I'm killed or not, end quote. Coroner's jury has declared that Joseph is the murderer. Alice, quote, had died from wounds probably inflicted by Joseph Englehart, end quote. For Annie and Thomas, the jury found that they, quote, had come to their death from wounds inflicted by someone unknown, end quote. Interesting, but remember that forensics in these times were not anywhere as sophisticated as they are now. Now they'd be getting the bullets out of the bodies and testing them against the gun's barrel markings, fingerprints possibly, blood spatter left on Joseph's body if there was any, whose blood was it, that all could be tested now. They mainly had to work off of circumstantial evidence, and yes, they did get it wrong sometimes. Anyway, we'll never know the why. Sounds to me like the man had a lot of issues, perhaps many of them related to his excessive drinking. Was he the sort that could have had one wrong thing said to him and he would lose it? Was he already planning something to begin with, considering he had purchased a gun earlier that day and some of the things he had said to people? And if so, why? Was he told something in the previous seance and in his meeting with the Cirrus that day that warped his mind into doing something horrible? He had family. He had a place to live. He had a job. But he also had a problem with alcohol, according to others, and was not hiding it one bit. And he had an aggressive demeanor while using it. We can speculate all day long, but we'll never know. Rest in peace to his victims and their loved ones. If you enjoy stories like this, please like and subscribe. Thank you.